Royal Highnesses, Excellencies, and esteemed delegates, please join me in welcoming Eleni Giocos, news anchor and media presenter. A very good afternoon, Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm delighted to join you today for uh, a session that is perhaps one of the most pertinent as we embark on our climate change agenda globally. My name is Eleni Jokas. I am a correspondent and anchor for CNN. Um, our session <coughs> this afternoon is ESG 2.0, developing metrics and processes to drive widespread adoption of sustainable business. And we're talking about measurable outcomes. What is the impact? What are we trying to achieve and how do we measure where our money is being spent? And when we talk about ESG projects, what does that mean down the line for businesses and for governments? There are more than 80 ESG frameworks and reporting standards, all addressing different aspects of sustainability and using different assessment methodologies. And these have been developed across the world, but there's a huge need for standardization. And as COP26 gets underway, that is going to be the big question. We're putting all of these strategies and we're putting targets in place, but how do we achieve those and how do we measure these targets? The private sector is going to be such a fundamental part of that, and we've seen so many different uh, methodologies being adopted. I'm delighted to uh, welcome our panelists today that will hopefully shed some light about what they're doing in their respective fields and, of course, in their businesses, but importantly, to give a sense of what they need to see when we talk about standardization of these methodologies. I'd like to welcome Karim Awad, the group CEO, chairman of the executive committee and member of the board EFG Hermes. We have uh, Jean-Bernard Lévy, uh, chairman and CEO global of the EDF group. Welcome, uh, Rebecca Minguela, founder and CEO of Clarity AI. And a welcome to Ronald O'Hanley, chairman and CEO of State Street Corporation. And Christine Tai, CEO and founding partner of 500 Startups. A welcome to all of you. Great to see you. Um, we have a complex topic. It is multi-layered. It has so many elements. And it's something that you grapple with, perhaps on a daily basis. Uh, my first question is, I think to set the scene, what are you doing in your respective companies? What are the dilemmas that you are, are dealing with and what frameworks you've chosen to adopt? Karim, let's start with you. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I think, uh, as you said, this is a very complex uh, topic. We are uh, a company that is operating in the region, in most of the countries in the GCC and across uh, North Africa, and we are headquartered in Egypt. So we are actually proud to be one of the first companies to have been uh, um, a signatory to the UNPRI. This is how we report on our uh, sustainability goals on a yearly basis and our SDGs. Um, but as you said, it has been a complex process. There are no standards. There are very, a lot of different standards that are sometimes contradictory in nature even. It's very difficult to come up with a score, a quantitative score. It's very qualitative in nature. So what we do in our company is that we try to run uh, businesses taking into consideration all the ESG uh, uh, policies that we have. We invest in renewables. We're a very heavy investor in renewables, not only in the region, but across Europe. Uh, we are an investor, a big investor in education. We feel that a big portion of our role is to um, enable financial inclusion through uh, ownership in microfinance entities and consumer financing companies, and hopefully a bank, a commercial bank in Egypt soon. So this is part of where we believe that we can uh, play a role in our ESG uh, uh, responsibility. Absolutely, and you, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, it's, you know, what you're looking at is a lot of qualitative data, and how do you quantify your impact? Uh, Jean-Bernard, I'd like for you to jump in here. Tell me a little bit about what you do, and as we've already come to know, there's been 
been reporting fatigue when it comes to ESG standards, and there's so many frameworks and overlapping. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. I'm also very pleased to be here, and I can tell you there is no fatigue related to uh, our vision for uh, net zero in 2050, which is our, our commitment in EDF. Maybe a few words about EDF. We are the former monopoly, the former monopoly for electricity in France. We have been uh, competing on all our uh, products and services now for more than 15 years, but we have grown as an energy company, not only in electricity, but also in gas and services and, and many other things. Uh, together, we are present in about 50 countries all around the world with a, uh, a turnover of uh, roughly 80 billion euros. Um, our ESG policy, of course, there is this ESG data inflation and uh, standardization is, uh, I would say, uh, still in motion. It's not really, really clear. Um, first, what we, what we have is what we have a raison d'etre. We have a purpose, which we defined together with a lot of our employees in 2019, and which is now embedded in our statutory documents, uh, in our bylaws. And the raison d'etre is around the climate uh, 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 mission of, um, of EDF and uh, our uh, key objectives regarding, regarding carbon neutrality, preserving the planet's resources, well-being and solidarity, and responsible development. So we now have a, a guide as we, this is our sort of mission statement, our raison d'etre, in order to implement our uh, ESG policy, our ESG policies. Of course, it is a complex uh, matter, so we have selected what we believe are the most useful uh, 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 KPIs in order to manage internally. So we have selected 16 KPIs in order to measure our key commitments. Of course, 16 KPIs is a certain number yeah. which we, with which I can be familiar, but of course, some of my colleagues will be familiar with much more, but at my level, it is 16 KPRs where we measure our, our corporate social responsibility program. Now, regarding standards, we work a lot on the TCFD and GHG protocols, and uh, we also uh, try to, to work as much as possible based on our SBTI commitments, which we believe are becoming a sort of de facto standard. Rebecca, jump in here for me as well, because you've been focusing on solving this dilemma with technology for many years. So tell me about some of the, the issues that you've come across and how you plan to help businesses navigate this. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to participate in, in this panel with uh, such great panelists. Uh, so at Clarity AI, what we provide is a tech platform to help uh, uh, investors and companies address those challenges uh, that, that you are mentioning, the, the challenge of the data availability, so lack of data, uh, lack of reliability of the data as well, and multiple frameworks, as you said, more than 80 frameworks uh, just for ESG, but there are also many others just for climate, like you mentioned on TCFD, or uh, temperature alignment, so there are too many frameworks right now. It's important to select one, like they did. It's important to select critical KPIs uh, for your objectives as a company or as an investor. And what we did at Clarity is we have been developing over five years a technology platform that is now being used by large asset managers like BlackRock. It's integrated into the existing workflows of, uh, of investors. So asset servicing platforms, fund distribution platforms like all funds, all Uh We, uh, our clients are looking at the Clarity capabilities today cover more than 20 trillions of uh, assets under management, 20 trillion dollars of assets under management. So our goal keeps being uh, providing tools to investors to apply whatever framework they want. It's, it's clear that we need the standardization of frameworks. There are several efforts being made um, late, uh, late at the moment by Europe with the European um, taxonomy, uh, the EU taxonomy and the SFDR on trying to standardize frameworks. Uh, but uh, but uh, even if uh, there are not frameworks, uh, clear standard frameworks today, they, that's not an excuse, right? So there are tools, and that's our, our goal, to provide tools to actually apply whatever framework you decide as a company or as, a, or as an investor. So th 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 there shouldn't be excuses to, to start um, uh, walking the talk, right? 
Thank you, that's great. Lots to talk about there. Um, Ron, uh, I know that your ESG investments have uh, increased. So I'm sure you've also been dealt with this big issue. How do you measure the impact versus just um, you know, talking about disclosure? How are you dealing with these investments and the money that's flowing in? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, thanks for being here. And this is a really important topic. At, at State Street, we think about this really in two different ways. Like everybody else on this panel and many in this room, we have our own companies or entities to think about and how we, uh, what are our goals. We also have a 2050 and a 2030 goal. Are we making progress towards that? How are we measuring that progress? How are we disclosing that progress uh, to our investors? So we use frameworks and, and uh, protocols such as TCFD. Um, but the, maybe the larger role State Street plays is because of its business. We're an investment manager and we're an investment servicer. So we're exclusively focused on supporting institutional investors achieve better outcomes. And as, this, as ESG has become more important to investors, and remember, it's really started out as a uh, part of the risk framework. How do we think about ESG in terms of the risk that we're taking? Uh, and the rewards that we might get. So we invest that way. When we invest, we steward those portfolio companies. Many of our companies uh, are in index portfolios. So if you think about that, we're going to own those for as long as they're in the index. We are permanent capital for them. So how do we think about engaging and stewarding those assets and what frameworks do we apply there? And then finally, how do we help investors do all this for themselves? I mean, this is actually... Uh, maybe the most revolutionary thing to face the investment world since the whole concept of asset allocation. Um, so there's tools, there's methodologies, there's KPIs. The question needs to be answered. One, what are the risks are we taking? And two, are we achieving our desired outcomes? So that's how we think about it Thank in you, an overall perspective. Okay, Christine, uh, you work with a lot of startups. So tell me about how you implement frameworks and try and figure out what the best methodologies are. And I'm sure, like we've heard from everyone, it seems that you've got a, it's multifaceted here. You have to use as many as possible depending on what you want your outcomes to be. Well, I'll echo what a lot of my fellow panelists have said. You know, really, thank you, and it's great to be here and talking about something very important, yet also very complex. I think of all of the panelists here, I certainly am coming from the vantage point of very early stage companies, which is not necessarily what um, we think of when we talk about ESG. There's a lot more focus on the public companies, um, maybe private equity. Um, but my firm, 500 Global, formerly 500 Startups, uh, we invest early in uh, high growth tech startups. Um, we are typically the first or one of the first institutional investors into these companies. And then we recently are looking to expand our scope into these companies. So we not just write the first check, but all the way potentially up to the last check pre-IPO or um, you know, pre-exit. So um, our, our scope is really, um, you know, in terms of ESG, it is something that we have found, um, it is pretty enlightening to hear what a lot of, um, a lot of my fellow panelists have said in terms of the, um, the challenges with different standards and frameworks. If you think about the early stage when these are you know, just the founders or the founding team, um, there's, it's even more of the, the Wild West in some ways. ESG is not something they think about. Oftentimes it's, it's an afterthought. They're just trying to get their product um, up and running. They're trying to hit product market fit. So we felt like our, our opportunity as an investor is to really help bring those uh, standards in, in terms of the awareness, um, especially with everything that has happened in 2020, um, you know, all, all sorts of uh, you know, climate change issues and, and social issues, particularly in the US and all around. Um, ESG, whether our founders understand the term ESG, it is something that is very much top of mind. Even in our own uh, survey of our portfolio, like more than 80% want to integrate that, but there is no framework for early stage companies. In fact, even for 500, we have taken standards from existing, you know, existing standards, like many of the ones that um, have been named, and really use those to guide our own set of, um, we kind of had to adapt that for, for our firm, for our, our guidance to our companies, because there is really no standard 
um, at the early stages, and that's actually where you can have the most impact. Um, you know, we've seen the, the downsides of a lot of these tech startups that have gone on and done extremely well, changed technology, been very disruptive, yet there's the, the downside of what technology can bring yeah. when there isn't um, some sort of uh, framework around it. Um, and so we feel like by trying to institute this or trying to educate our companies when it's still early, they can be better set up for success, hopefully, and not have to um, have costly changes later on. I actually want, I'd love for you to give me a bit of insight. I think that there's this, you know, idea that the new companies, the startups, almost have climate change agendas at the heart of what they do. You hear a lot of new companies that are springing up, they're thinking more ethically. Mm -hmm. is, that, is, not, is that not the case, would you say? Um, or do you think that they might have a good intention, but they just don't know how to implement um, some of their business strategies in the best way that will, you know, hit the mark on ESG or SDGs. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, especially when you see some of the, the headlines recently in, in tech and, uh, you know, big tech companies and the, the fang companies, I, and certainly none of them started out with the intent to, to cause, uh, you know, to cause issues. Yeah. It's more that it's been an afterthought and they, they certainly may have chased growth and, and high valuations and, and user bases, but um, not necessarily think about what's the downstream impact on society, on, on you know, on, on, on consumers. So um, in terms of uh, in terms of the companies that we work with today, it's definitely more top of mind. I think there's just not a huge incentive for them to do it unless the founders particularly care about it or there's someone maybe pushing them to do it. And yeah. I think in, uh, one powerful way that can happen is uh, VCs who do invest in these companies pot potentially require that or they want to see some sort of mandate. And then if you move downstream for managers, if their own LPs expect this from their managers, um, then there is an impact there, but without that, it's um, you know there's no you know there's no standards, there's no you know regulation around this. So I think capital is obviously very powerful. I think this is a good moment to actually sort of unpack what ESG is because we talk about the environmental issues. You mentioned the social issues, and then you've got the governance as well. Rebecca, I know you were telling me backstage we've got to really look at what that means and what it means for businesses when they're looking at adopting certain frameworks. So give me a sense of how complex this might be when you are adopting a, a specific framework. Yeah, I, I believe one of the main uh, issues around ESG adoption is the confusion, right? Uh, yeah. Because ESG, as uh, Romberg well said before, uh, it just started as a framework to measure risk. Risk yes. linked to sustainability metrics. But it has been evolving in the last few years uh, with many different initiatives popping up, like the CFD with uh, disclosure around climate, temperature alignment, or the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which is 17 goals with 169 uh, targets. So the, the, the level of complexity and the aggregation of terms and frameworks under the umbrella of ESG is, is really confusing for, for investors and for companies. And um, as I said, the standardization is good as long as everyone agrees on one framework and just follow that, follows that, right? Because now the European taxonomy or the SFDR, uh, which is the regulation for sustainable investing in Europe, is a new framework. <laughs> it's yeah. not an ESG framework, it's not a new and sustainable development goals framework, not TCFD. It's a new uh, taxonomy and uh, new indicators uh, that investors and corporates have to follow. So instead of maybe developing new frameworks by different institutions, we should just focus on follow yeah. one. John Bernard, I want you to jump in here and you know, how important are CEOs in being advocates of ESG um, and what, what lessons can we learn from companies that have truly adopted uh, ESG at the heart of what they do? Well, first, uh, let me make it clear. Um, I don't see how today a company can be run if the board and the CEO do not take care of E and S and G. So I, I do not believe ESG is a single matter. Yeah. It so happens that there, is a, there are some interferences between E and S and E and G and S and G, and so on, so it may be convenient to put them together. Yeah. But in reality, these are quite different matters. Yeah. And one could say they are all risk-related. If you don't perform well with respect to the environment, with respect to your social communities, with respect to the way you, the governance is implemented, then you get into a risky situation. Um, most companies will probably have ESG managed by a single committee, but it's not so obvious to me that this should be the case. 
maybe uh, for some companies, the uh, environmental matters should be managed more by a, an audit and risk committee than by a dedicated um, uh, committee, which will also decide about the company's governance or whatever. In EDF, it so happens it's a single committee. We have a climate champion at the board. Yeah. We have uh, various entities. Um, which report to me, which I chair, which I don't chair, which uh, take care of these matters. So I think we need to get organized and try to follow what I was saying about the ESG data inflation, yeah. which is uh, some kind of a threat. And may I also add something which I think is, is of paramount importance. We are focusing here, here in this room, and generally speaking, we are focusing on environmental risks related to the way we are viewed by investors, such as State Street. But this is only part of the problem. A, a, a big problem too, I would not rate them, is how our environmental policies are viewed by our employees or by the talents that we would like to hire. So, we need to speak. For so you've, been holding, you've been held to account on all levels. Oh, People are asking questions. I receive letters from students yeah. or from students' organizations tell me, you know, what is your policy regarding, let's say, climate, as you are a utility, a utility yeah. and you may be, be a huge polluter of, uh, uh, through carbon, or maybe not. It so happens we are not. So it's easier for me to come here and say, we're doing great because of our legacy <laughs> assets and so on. But of course, we have to report to our, 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 the employees or the potential employees. And similarly, we have to report to consumers or to consumer groups. So I don't think we should focus only, of course, we have to focus on the way the investor community, whether it's equity or for borrowing or whatever, uh, is, looking, is looking at us. But we are also responsible in front of our employees and the people who like to hire, that future talents, and we are responsible in front of our, of our clients. More and more, I get, I get uh, letters or I get mails or whatever, or when I talk to people, they say, including customers, they say, you know, we, we want to listen more about your climate policy, because if we uh, do a business with you, if we sign a contract with you, we, we need to also explain why it was with you with respect to climate or environmental biodiversity issues. So I think we need to rebalance the fact that, yes, it is very important for investors. Yes, there is more and more money going to ESG in what is collected from uh, savings. But we also have the other two parts of the equation to take care of. Thank you for sharing that. Okay, Ron, I see you want to jump in yeah, here. Th this is a very important distinction that's being made here, and I would describe it as the distinction between value and values. And from an investor perspective, I think it's actually quite important that we focus on value and not values. Um, as we're thinking about an investment or as we're holding an investment and stewarding it, We've got a set of values, we've got a set of personal and corporate values, but it's not upon us to impose them on our portfolio companies. On the other hand, we do believe that ESG represents an investment risk. Risk has some implications for value. Value is something that can be measured and uh, should be something that there's general agreement on. But I absolutely agree with the point that there's also a role for values here, just not in the investment equation. Harry, um, I was looking at an HSBC report that basically said pre-pandemic levels in terms of companies that operate in this region um, would only take f around sort of 20 percent would take climate change uh, issues into consideration into their business strategies. Now, over 65 percent of businesses are taking climate change issues into consideration with their business strategies. There's been a fundamental shift that's happening within the Middle Eastern region. Are you seeing that change? Are you seeing that shift? And how has that impacted the way you are looking at your business? It has not happened definitely to the level that we're at. some of my fellow panelists are talking about in Europe and the rest of the world. I yeah. mean, the MENA region has its own specificities. Um, at the end of the day, you can actually look at ESNG on uh, separate levels here. Absolutely. So I can see over the past uh, 20 years a massive change in the way the G has evolved. 
the amount of governance, the amount of transparencies that companies, especially the publicly listed companies, are showing today is nowhere near where it was uh, 20 years ago. But sometimes also, the E and the S, sometimes they do contradict, right? So you can, for example, do a massive shift, and I know that this is not really going with the mainstream of the, of the panel here today, but you can do a massive shift in terms of the environment, for example, and have a massive societal impact in terms of unemployment and unemployment levels in a region where yeah. the, so most of the population is extremely young and coming into the, uh, into the employee force. Exactly. I mean, you're talking about developmental issues, and most of the region and some of the countries are still trying to industrialize. And now you're saying, well, this is, these are the frameworks you need to adhere to. It doesn't make sense. A absolutely. And this is why when we're talking about future standards or one standard for all, it has also to take into consideration that emerging markets, for example, might be a, a bit different, that their level of development or their level of needs might be very different for the rest of the world. And this is where having a one global standard might be an issue going forward, for sure. Okay. So, um, Rebecca, come in here. I mean, the International uh, Financial Reporting Standards Foundation, so IFRS, is trying to... They're talking about standardization. Yeah. Is that a risk? Is that the right thing to do? Is that what the industry wants? What do business leaders yeah. want? Yeah, I think that going back to the same point, and all the F uh, IFRS, as, uh, RS, as you are saying, in the US is trying to set another standard. But again, are they going to be basing their standard in the standard that already set in Europe or not? Because if they are going to now come up with a new standard. So the, the, the reality is that they should be coordinating with the standard already set in Europe so investors don't have, again, two different frameworks that they have to comply with. Well, investors and corporates. Then to, to your point on the, on the MENA region companies, I, I think it's a great point that they, they need to be given a, an opportunity to set their own indicators mm. and demonstrate that they set a commitment and they comply with that commitment. And sometimes they shouldn't be measured in the same way that other companies that might be in regions that are uh, more industrialized, as you were saying. So right now, for example, there are, I believe, 1,700 companies that are listed in the MENA region, if I'm not mistaken, uh, more <laughs> or less. And uh, in our platform, in our technology platform, we cover about 60% of them, so information around, um, around 1,000 uh, companies that we cover. But most of the information that we have in our platform is estimations, because those companies are not disclosing enough information. But many times, it's because the level of disclosure that is expected for a company in the US or in Europe is not relevant for the companies in the region, right? So you cannot many times measure them uh, with the same framework. So, so that's an issue. And uh, Christine, I'm sure you have this issue as well when you're dealing with startups, right? It's not a blanket approach for all. Yeah, I mean, especially when um, you know, these companies are very young, I think that's sometimes some of the aversion to seed stage, early stage venture because it is so high risk. Obviously, when you're investing at that stage and these companies eventually um, break out and, um, and, and do well, then the upside is massive. But until then, I think um, one of the things that we, we definitely have seen over the past 11 years that 500 has been investing um, in, in markets around the world is there is no standard in terms of reporting. Um, you know, it, it's, it's really on us to um, try to communicate what we look for. But even then, you know, some companies, you know, even very tactically, they will send you know, monthly reports, quarterly reports, uh, very, you know, maybe sometimes no reports. Um, and then and when it just, is about it just disclosure that the reports that you're getting? They're just disclosing what they're doing as opposed to talking about impact, for example? These are typically uh, investor updates. Um, we obviously, as investors, um, for our funds and our, 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 our limited partners, we need information in terms of valuations. Um, but in, in terms of ESG reporting, um, because again, it is such a new, uh, new thing for our startups, um, you know, we are probably one of the first uh, venture firms that has implemented ESG for our funds. Um, the vast majority have not. Um, a lot of the focus, especially in Silicon Valley and in and, and many markets around the world of the ESG letters, there's probably a lot more focus on S because um, you don't think right off the bat E is a big factor in, in technology, right? There's no, yeah. typically no goods being produced, but there are ways that they can indirectly have that influence in terms of, um, you know, as an example, one of our, uh, one of our large companies, Canva, uh, which just raised a pretty significant round, they're now valued at 40 billion, they're still a privately held company. Um, they have already hit their goal of being carbon, uh, carbon neutral, um, based on um, you know, a lot of the, the vendors they work with and, and, and the choices um, that they make and actually aim to be carbon positive in the next few years. So th those are good examples where even the tech companies can set those types of uh, metrics on the E side 
um, but in terms of uh, the active reporting, not just on their company performance, but also ESG, um, that is something that is, is going to be, uh, it is definitely early days. I want to talk about transition uh, to net zero, to carbon neutral, and you know we've seen so many commitments coming through over the past few weeks in the lead up to COP26. And even the oil producing countries, specifically Saudi Arabia, has also committed to becoming carbon neutral by 2060. So you're seeing you know, commitment on the table, but how do we measure this transition and these commitments um, that have been announced? Because <laughs> that's going to be the hardest thing, right? Do we, is it about trust? Is it about you know, using different methodologies? Uh, how do you, I mean, Kareem, I see you're... <laughs> no, I mean... Uh, grinning. <laughs> what no, do we do? I mean, this is, this is, it's going to be an interesting one, I think. I think you have to have a, a, a quantitative measure there, right? Yeah. It cannot all be qualitative because sometimes, uh, and I think uh, some of my pan fellow panelists have raised that, there is a lot of data that is being thrown around that is qualitative in nature and not really, and that investors sometimes uh, feel that they are being, uh, for the lack of a better word, fooled, right? By uh, telling them stuff that might not be concrete or measurable in, uh, in terms of value. Uh, however, also to turn back the focus into the region, you also have to have an incentive for a lot of the companies that are out there in terms of the flows that they're going to see into, into their companies, right? Because some of them are listed, some of them have uh, reporting, quarterly reportings. As, uh, as again, one of our panelists said, you know, some companies start out with good intentions, then the pressure of reporting quarter after quarter, profits after profits. So they have to see a financial impact also on their valuations, on how they do things in order for them to continue uh, driving towards those goals. All right, thank you, Jean-Bernard. Um, as and you mentioned it earlier, power utilities do have a bad reputation, generally speaking, right? Um, in terms of you are uh, an energy producer, you might be a cleaner energy producer versus um, those uh, that burn fossil fuels and hydrocarbons, um, but div diversifying the energy mix is going to be important. I think people are watching very closely about what that is going to look like in the future. How do you respond to that? We have a transparent policy yeah. that is made of uh, commitments, roadmaps, milestones, reporting. We are happy to be challenged whether these uh, roadmaps and milestones are the right ones or not. Towards our net zero commitment in 2050, we are not, not going to say it will all start to happen in 2047. We are doing it day after day. We are reporting it every year on some metrics more often than once a year. We have decided that because we continue to receive uh, an un unbelievable number of questionnaires from all kinds of people who describe themselves as the standardizer or whatever, you know. What's the toughest question that they ask you? Oh, you know, I don't know, 50, 100, 300 <laughs> questions. So we have a team of a few people trying to respond to them. But what we decided two years ago is that we open a, 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 an open source data platform so that everybody can have easy access to more than 500 raw, raw metrics, carbon and so on, waste, water consumption, female workforce, whatever so that at least those people where maybe we don't have enough resources and time yeah. to respond to all these amazing questionnaires from very bright people, at least they can go to our database. And of course, in that database, there is the, the number, but also the, the reference, how we calculate it, what is the standard we use to calculate each uh, number. But going back to your question, uh, I think there is no other way than to uh, to comply step by step and to demonstrate step by step that we are in the right direction. For instance, when some fossil fuel based um, uh, uh, um, uh, investment come to my desk, and we're not saying we're not investing at all in fossil fuel. We do, we do have a few natural gas investment, but we have an internal policy to accept them only in certain conditions especially if this gas will be um, amortized in the short term and when it replaces coal. But we have even for that a limited amount of tons of carbon that we can emit year after year. Yeah. So when such an investment comes to my desk, 
I have some people checking that it is con uh, consistent with the tons of carbon budget that we have allocated year after year. And if it isn't, we won't do it. Here's a tough question, right? You've got oil producing countries saying they want to be carbon neutral. And of course, it's going to be a tough task. And we're talking about the energy mix mostly. Uh, that's one of the biggest uh, issues. But then you also have the other issue where you're producing fossil fuels and you're selling them to other countries. How would you, Rebecca, start to measure those outcomes, what the targets are? Do you think that there's going to be regulation regarding this? What does the future hold? Yeah, th there is a regulation already, as I said, in, in Europe, there are regulation uh, or efforts, uh, yeah. regulation efforts to measure this. But uh, of course, the, the transition, uh, the word says, takes time, right? It's a transition yeah. to something else. We cannot, uh, sometimes I, I talk to clients who want to uh, uh, have zero emissions in their portfolios. And then I say, well, if you only invest in the best performers who have zero emissions today, you are not going to reduce any emissions in the future, right? Because many times what you might want to do is investing in the worst performer, the one who is the highest pollutant, but help those highest pollutants to reduce emissions, transition into something else, a different type of energy, because they are serving a need. They are serving a need of, of all of us, right? So it's not that uh, fossil fuels are going to disappear like that, because... Uh, there is a huge need. It's the same with cement companies. Cement is something that is needed. You're not going to stop needing cement, and right? It's a high polluter, absolutely. So you just need to make sure that you transition in a, in a responsible way and making sure there is a plan. We are lacking a plan. That's, that's many times the problem, that there is not a plan of what are we going to be doing. And just encouraging investors to, to focus on having zero emissions in their portfolio, moving away from cement, moving away from fossil fuels is not the answer, in my opinion. The answer is helping those companies transition to cleaner energies. Ron. Yeah, I mean, the, Tell me. the, the challenge with this problem is that there's a real danger that we're losing sight of the overall objective. It's about decarbonizing the atmosphere. It is a global problem. It's not a problem that sits over State Street or that sits over EDF. Uh, and in fact, that the best way to solve it is if you could optimize for what it takes to, uh, to lower carbon emissions in the atmosphere overall. So we very, may very well find ourselves in the spot where, in fact, investing in a hydrocarbon generating plant, a gas plant in India, might be a very good thing because, in fact, we're avoiding a lot of investment or we're taking offline a lot of coal-fired plants. And, and this is the problem with a lot of the, we've been here talking about standards and measures. You know, we can all, we could very well find ourselves in the spot that every company feels good about what it's doing and we haven't gotten there. And so I think we have to remember that there's a couple of kinds of standards here. That one is what is actually contained in what we're doing or in our portfolios if you're an investor. And then two, what are the actual outcomes that we're achieving? And at, at some point we need to evolve towards clear, consistent and comparable standards. Yeah. Uh, there is a role for government here, but there's also a role for governments to cooperate on this and agree that they're going to impose those standards on us because honestly, if we find ourselves in the spot that we were taking a few companies, they were making all public companies look much better than they are, we might not solve the problem. Christine, we, oh yeah, we've got about seven minutes left, so I'd like to get a sense from all of you um, the next step, but Christine, Here's a simple question. How do you build a company you know, from scratch that has ESG at the very heart of that? Do you think that that is going to be uh, something that will be standardized going forward? Because it what might be easier to start in saying, these are the metrics that I have to hit as I start this business, as opposed to trying to retrofit it at a later stage. I think that's a tough question. I mean, the ideal is that there is some sort of standard such that um, going forward, you know, maybe in the next few years, it is something that right off the bat, tech companies, startups are thinking about such that down the road, when it's hard to see, some of these companies will die before they even get that successful, but at least down the line, they won't run into these challenges. But I think it's, it's really, it doesn't, it, it's really about, again, about that incentive, um, who's holding them accountable yeah. to uh, achieve those standards and understanding that it is a very iterative process. It's not that we expect these companies to have this all implemented and know what they're doing from the beginning. It's really more um, that they're, it's, it's top of mind and they're actively working towards it. And, and again, also there, it's a long-term game. It's not something that we expect 
Um, you, you can't measure it the same way you might measure a public company. Like it's, it's something that um, you may not see the results or the impact for, for many years just because they're small. Um, and I, I think that the more that uh, it's, it's not just one firm, it's not certainly just 500 global, it's not just um, any, any given company, but it's really um, all of these stakeholders uh, in some ways uh, reinforcing that such that um, it, it does become more of a standard that you know when when they are starting out they consider you know whatever environmental factors are relevant um, certainly on the social side governance is, is quite probably yeah. the, the maybe the most lacking um, when it comes to, to early stage companies um, but I, I do think that uh, the more that the, the, the capital they take um, the more that that is something that's um, I hate to use the word imposed but more that that's um, held in terms of accountability, then um, we'll start to see more of, um, um, hopefully in the long run, we won't see more incidents like what we see about with Facebook or yeah. Uber or uh, uh, name, name your tech company. Um, and we'll start to see, uh, uh, you know, we, we'll hopefully avoid m more of those types of situations. Fantastic, okay. So uh, last comments from our panelists. The way forward, and whether you're feeling optimistic, to be honest, um, looking at the urgency um, and the, the, the uh, incredible impact we've seen uh, in the world on the climate issue, it leaves one really worried about the future. But it's, as we said, it's more than that. It's the social issues, the governance issues, the developmental issues we need to take into consideration. It's energy security. It's just, it cuts across so many sectors. So last comments. Uh, how do you feel about the future and do you think that businesses are going to play a vital part in making sure we can achieve some of these enormous goals? Kareem. Uh, I think absolutely we feel optimistic about it and it's something that will happen because as we were correctly pointed out that the younger generations are pushing for it. But it also has, there has to be a, an element of uh, patience to it because uh, some of these goals will not be seen by some of the generations that are even sitting on those panels, right? So, and the investor bases also have to have that level of patience because if you're looking for immediate return on investments, they're not going to come in conjunction with this. Fantastic, Jean-Bernard. Well, I wanted to conclude on something a bit different. First, I would like uh, to say that in our uh, ESG commitments, we need to take care of energy poverty. Yeah. And I'm sorry we didn't discuss it, but I think it's a very important part of what we, we have to do. We need to make sure energy is available and affordable. My, my second point is I would like to pray that in a few years' time, just as we have basically two accounting standards in the world, US GAAP and IFRS, maybe we have no more than two and maybe <laughs> even less than two similar uh, non-financial uh, standards. And the third point, uh, and once again, I think it's uh, one of the most important elements of what we are doing is we work for the future generations, the people yeah. that will be there in 2040, 50, 60. So I spend a lot of time uh, watching our rank in, uh, in France, where we have 80% of the workforce in, uh, for engineers. And we are a top three company all the time with Airbus, Google, and EDF. Yeah. Airbus, Google, and EDF, or EDF, Google, and Airbus, whichever way. We want to keep that for the future, and I think it's a, it's a very important metric. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned energy poverty, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on on that, because I know that France is busy with its reindustrialization program, but it wants to do it in a green way. I actually had a similar conversation with uh, former President Francois Hollande, and I asked him the question on the role of nuclear in our future to solve energy poverty. And when we look at uh, developing countries, you've got, look, coal is still very much a reality. You know, you have to rely on your hydrocarbons if you want to solve that problem because Africa, for example, still needs to industrialize. Other emerging markets have that same dilemma. What is the energy source of the future, do you think, as we're trying to desperately diversify away from dirty uh, sources? I think we have three pillars. Yeah. Efficiency first, okay. and then the right mix between nuclear and renewables. Yeah, okay. Nuclear still remains the cleanest, actually. So. But, of course, this will depend on each country's policy mix. There is a Absolutely. rule everywhere in the world. Each country decides its own policy mix. Absolutely. Let, okay. Let's not forget, the best way to achieve it is by being much more efficient. Absolutely. Look, I come from South Africa, and we still rely 85% on coal. So I, I totally understand that dilemma and the developmental issues. Rebecca. 
Yeah, I would say actually to that point as well, it's, uh, it's about uh, ruthless prioritization, right? So we need to prioritize what we want to focus on. We cannot have so many objectives that need to be done in such a short period of time. So if it's efficiency, for example, let's focus on maximize efficiency. So let's focus our efforts on the things that are going to get the highest or, or the better outcomes, right? Because sometimes we start doing other things that might not really bring as much uh, uh, outcome that, that we want. That's one. And the other one is, of course, adoptions of technology uh, to make it scalable, right? In the measurement, uh, in the adoption, in the implementation, right? So it's only through technology that we are going to achieve the scalability and the, and the speed yeah. that we need to do what we need to do yeah. in such a... You're right. The speed, time. right? We've run out of time. Ron. You've asked if... I think your question was, are we optimistic? And yeah. I am optimistic. If you think about uh, the world's investors, uh, all of them are focused on this issue. They're trying to figure out what role they can play, both in the existing capital they have uh, committed, and more importantly, fresh capital, right, which will help on the demand side here. So I am optimistic. I do think the one thing that needs to happen is we have to have a global carbon pricing mechanism because yeah. that will take that, that will help achieve a lot of the outcomes that Rebecca is talking about. It will put the right incentives in place. But, but until we get that, we're going to work around the edges, have lots of different standards. So, if I could do one thing, it would be that. All right, fantastic. Thank you, Christine. Yeah, I, I think it's tough to be um, in venture capital, particularly in early stage, if you don't have that optimism and you don't think that the impossible can be achieved. So certainly, even though it seems pretty far away or pretty daunting. Uh, we definitely believe ESG will increasingly become important um, at the early stages, hopefully. It's more top of mind for founders. Um, and I think the point that um, was made about certainly a lot of this discussion is around value for investors and, 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 and the company, but um, it's just more of a demand with this new generation. I, I learned what is after Gen Z is gen, Generation Alpha, apparently. That's where my kids fall. Um, but increasingly, the younger generations actually care about this from a consumer perspective, where they choose to work. And so I think it's, it's yeah. just going to con increasingly um, continue. So uh, certainly optimistic. Absolutely. Look, there's lots of money chasing ESG. We know that it's a part of the uh, global agenda. So um, it's up to you, ladies and gentlemen, the business leaders, the policy makers to make good on this. Um, and, you know, us consumers will be writing the letters, checking in if you're meeting those, uh, those targets. So thank you very much for your honesty and for your insights and for this wonderful conversation. Thank you to my panelists and thank you for joining us today. Thank you very much.